Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over paper one, i.e. the multiple choice questions from the 2024 SQA Higher Physics exam paper. Now, there are 25 questions in this section, and I recommend that you try them yourself before looking at these solutions. So let's get started. Question one says a cyclist traveling along a straight track accelerates at 1.2 meters per second squared. The speed of the cyclist increases from 4.0 meters per second to 7.5 meters per second. The distance traveled by the cyclist during this acceleration is. Well, here we should be thinking about equations of motion. So we're going to start by writing down SUVAT, where we're trying to find the distance or displacement S. We know that initial speed U is 4.0 meters per second. The final speed V is 7.5 meters per second. The acceleration A is 1.2 meters per second squared. And we don't know what the time T is. So because we're trying to find the distance s here, let's put a star next to that one. And therefore, we need to choose an equation of motion that doesn't have t in it. So we need to use the equation v squared equals u squared plus 2es. Substituting in the numbers gives 7.5 squared equals 4.0 squared plus 2 times 1.2 times s. And then to simplify this a wee bit, we could do 2 times 1.2 times s, which is the same as 2.4s. And then we could take away 4.0 squared from both sides. And then swapping the sides round would give us 2.4s is equal to 40.25. And then to get s on its own, we can divide both sides by 2.4, so doing that in your calculator should give you an answer of s equals 17 meters, which is the answer b here. Question 2 says a ball is thrown vertically upwards and returns to its original position. Neglecting air resistance, which displacement time st graph represents its motion? Well, for a ball thrown vertically upwards and returning to its original position, the graph should show the displacement increasing and then decreasing over time. And also, the graph should show a gradual levelling off for the displacement when the ball reaches its highest point. So that means if we want the displacement increasing and then decreasing, but then when the ball is reaching its highest point, remember the displacement is going to level off over time before it starts travelling back down again. So therefore our answer won't be B or C because those don't show any levelling off for the displacement, which means our answer here is going to be this one with the parabola shape, which is option A. Question 3 says a box is suspended from a ceiling by a rope. A horizontal force F is acting on the box. The box is held stationary as shown. The weight of the box is 4.9 newtons. The tension T in the rope is. Well, you can see the horizontal force labelled on the box there, and the tension T in the rope labelled there. And we've also got this angle to the vertical, which is labelled 20 degrees. And so for this tension question, what we want to do is create a right angled triangle and use Sokka Toa to determine the tension T. And firstly, we can say vertically, the forces acting on the box are balanced. So because we know the weight of the box is 4.9 newtons, we could label that one first. So there's our weight of 4.9 newtons. But vertically, we're saying these forces are balanced since it's held stationary. That means we can label this upwards force in the box as 4.9 newtons as well. And what we could do here is extend this line up to here to create a right angled triangle. So sketching this over at the side, we've got our 4.9 newtons up the way there. We've then got our line that is the tension T, and we can complete the triangle there and add in our right angle. And it turns out we actually know what this angle is in here, which is the same as this angle here. And we can do that using the Z rule from maths, where if we create a Z shape like this, then the angle in here must be the same as the angle in here. So that means that this angle is 20 degrees. And then we can use Sokka Toa to determine what this unknown side T is. So if T is my hypotenuse, then we know what the adjacent side to the angle and the hypotenuse are. So we can use cos theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse, and then substituting in the numbers gives cos 20 equals 4.9 divided by t, and then rearranging for t we can cross multiply, which is the same as swapping these two terms round. So we get t equals 4.9 divided by cos 20, which gives us the answer 5.2 newtons, which is option D here. Question 4 says a ball is thrown horizontally over the edge of a cliff. A group of students draw three velocity time vt graphs to represent the motion of the ball when air resistance is taken into account. So you've got graph x, graph y and graph z. It then says which row in the table shows the graphs that represent the horizontal component of the velocity and the vertical component of the velocity. And our options are either some combination of x, y and z. Well firstly we could say that ignoring air resistance, which is usually what we do, the ball is a projectile with a constant horizontal velocity and constant vertical acceleration. However, taking air resistance into account, which is what we're asked to do in this question, we're dealing with curves rather than straight lines, as the velocities will not be constant. And therefore we can say that as air resistance increases, the horizontal component of the velocity will gradually decrease, as is shown by graph x, and so will the rate of increase of the vertical component of the velocity, i.e. the acceleration, which is shown in graph y where we've got this gradual decrease in the acceleration. Whereas graph Z would show an increase in the rate of increase of the vertical component of the velocity, i.e. an increase in acceleration, which wouldn't be the case when air resistance is taken into account. So that means graph X is showing what happens to the horizontal component of the velocity, and graph Y shows what happens to the vertical component of the velocity, which gives us answer A here. 
Question 5 says in a hydroelectric power station, water flows from a reservoir through turbines at a rate of 4.5 times 10 to the 6 kilograms per minute. The reservoir is 150 metres above the turbines. The total power delivered by the water in falling from the reservoir to the turbines is... We'll notice how we're asked to calculate power, but we're given things like a mass per unit time and a height. So what we can do is firstly calculate the gravitational potential energy of the water when it's in the reservoir. So that would be using the equation EP equals MGH. So substituting in our numbers, we have 4.5 times 10 to the 6 for the mass, times 9.8 for the gravitational field strength on Earth, times 150 for the height. And putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 6.615 times 10 to the 9 joules. Notice how we're not rounding at this stage. What we can then do to calculate the power is use an equation involving energy and time since we're given this mass in the form of a mass per unit time, kilograms per minute. So we have that power equals energy over time or EP over T in this case. And substituting in the numbers, because we're thinking about per minute, we're going to use 60 seconds as our time and we can sub in this energy here. So we have 6.615 times 10 to the 9 divided by 60 and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 1.1 times 10 to the 8 watts, which is the answer C here. Question 6 says two trolleys move along a level bench as shown. So you've got this 2.0 kilogram trolley moving at 5.0 meters per second to the right, and this collides with another trolley of mass 6.0 kilograms moving at 1.0 meters per second to the right. It then says the trolleys collide and stick together. They continue to move along the bench. The velocity of the trolleys immediately after the collision is. Well, we need to use our principle or law of conservation of linear momentum here, which says that total momentum before the collision is equal to total momentum after the collision, provided there are no external forces acting. So in word form we have this, and then in symbol form we can write m1u1 plus m2u2 equals m1v1 plus m2v2. So because they stick together, the final velocities v1 and v2 are going to be the same, so we could simplify that to just calling it v. And therefore if we have m1 times v plus m2 times v, we could factorise that to get the following. m1u1 plus m2u2 on the left is equal to m1 plus m2 times v, where we're taking the v outside the brackets there because both trolleys will have the same final velocity. We can then substitute in the numbers to get 2.0 times 5.0 plus 6.0 times 1.0 is equal to 2.0 plus 6.0 times v, where we don't need to worry about any negative signs because neither of our trolleys are moving to the left at any stage. Simplifying this will give us 10 plus 6 is equal to 8v. So we have 8.0v is equal to 16.0 once we've swapped the sides. And then to get v on its own, we just need to divide both sides by 8.0. So we get v equals 2.0 meters per second, which is the answer C here. Question 7 says a spacecraft is travelling at a speed of 0.20c relative to the Earth. The spacecraft emits a signal for 20.0 seconds as measured in the frame of reference of the spacecraft. An observer on Earth measures the duration of the signal as. Well this is a time dilation question so writing down our equation for that t dash or t prime equals t over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared. And the proper time t as measured in the frame of reference of the spacecraft is 20.0 seconds so that's going to be this one here whereas we're asked for the relativistic time t dash because it's measured by an observer on the Earth who is not in the frame of reference of the event. So all we need to do here is sub in the numbers in the right place. So we have t dash equals 20.0 divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.20c divided by c squared. And notice how the c's will cancel out on the top and bottom there. So if you do 0.2 squared and then 1 minus that answer and then the square root of that answer and then divide 20.0 by that, you should get an answer of 20.4 seconds, which is option D here. Question 8 says the Queen's Ferry Crossing has a length of 2,700 metres as measured by a stationary observer on Earth. A spaceship travels past Earth at a constant speed of 1.80 times 10 to the 8 metres per second relative to Earth. The length of the Queen's Ferry Crossing as measured by an observer on the spaceship is... Well this time we have a length contraction question, so writing down our equation for that we have L dash equals L times the square root of 1 minus V over C squared, where L is our proper length and L dash is our relativistic length or contracted length. Now we're told the proper length L here is 2700 meters because that's measured by a stationary observer on the Earth, whereas we want the contracted length as measured by an observer on the spaceship. So the person on board the spaceship is the one who is not in the frame of reference of the event, i.e. the Queensferry Crossing, because that's on Earth. So substituting in our numbers, we have 2700 times the square root of 1 minus 1.80 times 10 to the 8 over 3 times 10 to the 8 squared, where we're just substituting in the speed of light from the data sheet, and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 2200 metres, which is the answer C here. Question 9 says the graph shows how the energy emitted per second per unit area varies with the wavelength of the radiation for four stars W, X, Y and Z. So on the Y axis here you've got the energy emitted per second per unit area against wavelength on the X axis and we've got our four stars shown here which take the form of black body radiation curves. It then says a student makes the following statements based on the information shown in the graph. 
Statement 1 says star Z is hotter than star W. Statement 2 says the peak frequency of radiation emitted is greatest for star W. And lastly, statement 3 says star Y emits more energy per second per unit area than star X. Which of the statements is or are correct? Well, here's the graph again to help us. So for that first statement, star Z is hotter than star W. That is true because remember the curves that get higher on the graph are for larger temperatures, whereas those smaller curves are for the lower temperature stars. For statement 2, the peak frequency of radiation emitted is greatest for star W. Well, notice how the peak of W would be around here, and then the peak for X would be around here, the peak for Y would be around here, and the peak for Z would be around here. And to have the greatest peak frequency, you would need the lowest peak wavelength, which is actually star Z here because it's got the lowest peak wavelength compared to the other stars. So star W would actually have the lowest peak frequency since it's got the highest peak wavelength. So that means that second statement is false. And lastly, for statement 3, star Y emits more energy per second per unit area than star X. Well that is true because remember the energy emitted per second per unit area is the same as the total area under the curve. So star Y has a greater area under the curve than star X, so therefore star Y must emit more energy per second per unit area. And another way to think about that is that star Y is a higher temperature than star X, so it's going to emit more energy. So that means we have statements 1 and 3 only being correct, which gives us the answer D here. Question 10 says which of the following particles is a fermion? Well remember a fermion is another name for a matter particle which includes things like leptons and quarks. And remember leptons are made up of electrons, muons and taons. So here the only one that fits into that category is E, the muon. Whereas all the others, the W and Z boson, the photon and the gluon, they are all force carrying particles or force mediating particles which are actually bosons not fermions. Question 11 says the following statement represents beta decay. So we have a neutron decaying into a proton plus an electron plus an electron antineutrino. And it says beta decay provided the first evidence for the existence of the... Well, it's all to do with the end of the reaction here where we've got an electron antineutrino. So it actually provided evidence for the existence of neutrinos, which gives us the answer B. Question 12 says uranium-239 undergoes decay by emitting a beta particle. The nucleus formed as a result of this decay also undergoes decay by emitting a beta particle to form nucleus X. Nucleus X is... Well, starting off at uranium-239, it's undergoing two beta decays to get to nucleus X. So we need to remind ourselves that for a beta decay, the mass number A remains unchanged, which is this number at the top, whereas the atomic number Z at the bottom increases by 1. So if there's two beta decays occurring, the mass number 239 will stay the same, whereas the atomic number Z, which is 92 to begin with, will increase by 2 over the two beta decays. So therefore it must increase to 94. So we're looking for 239 for the mass number and 94 for the atomic number, which is going to be E for plutonium. Question 13 says the following statement represents a nuclear reaction. So we have carbon-12 plus an alpha particle decays to oxygen-16 plus a gamma ray. It says the total mass of the particles before the reaction is 26.572 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The total mass of the particles after the reaction is 26.560 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The energy released in this reaction is. So remember in these questions we need to find the lost mass or mass lost first of all and that's using the total mass before and after the reaction. So we have that the lost mass m is equal to 26.572 times 10 to the minus 27 minus 26.560 times 10 to the minus 27 and putting that into your calculator should give you 1.2 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. Remember not to round anything at this intermediate stage. And then we can use the equation E equals mc squared using the lost mass that we've just calculated. So substituting in our numbers we have 1.2 times 10 to the minus 20 times 3.00 times 10 to the 8 squared where c is the speed of light from the data sheet and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 1.08 times 10 to the minus 12 joules which is the option d here question 14 says a student carries out an experiment to investigate how a radiance of light varies with distance a small lamp is placed at a distance d from a light meter the radiance i at this distance is displayed on the light meter this measurement is repeated for a range of different distances. The student uses these results to plot the graph shown. So we've got a radiance on the y-axis against 1 over the distance squared on the x-axis, and we've got this line that is offset from the origin here. It says the graph indicates that there is a systematic uncertainty in the experiment. Which of the following alterations would be most likely to reduce the systematic uncertainty in this experiment? So we have repeating the experiment in a darkened room, repeating the readings at each distance and calculating averages, decreasing the brightness of the lamp, replacing the small lamp with a larger lamp, or increasing the range of distances. Well, because this experiment is to do with measuring irradiance and light levels, then the option that's most likely to reduce the systematic uncertainty in this experiment is repeating the experiment in a darkened room, which gives us the answer A here. 
Question 15 says a group of students make the following statements about coherent waves. Statement 1 says coherent waves have a constant phase relationship. Statement 2 says coherent waves have the same frequency. And lastly, statement 3 says coherent waves have the same speed. Which of the statements is or are correct? Well, firstly, coherent waves have a constant phase relationship. That is true for coherent waves. And we can also say the same about coherent waves having the same frequency and speed. And in actual fact, coherent waves have the same speed, frequency, and wavelength. If you think about the three parts of the wave equation, V equals F lambda, all three of those variables need to be the same for coherent waves. So that means we have all three being correct here, which is the answer E. Question 16 says dark lines in an absorption spectrum occur because photons move from higher to lower energy levels emitting electrons, photons move from lower to higher energy levels by absorbing electrons, electrons move from lower to higher energy levels emitting photons, electrons move from higher to lower energy levels emitting photons, or electrons move from lower to higher energy levels by absorbing photons. Well, it firstly helps to think about this picture here, where a photon is being absorbed, which causes an electron to move from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. And remember these electron transitions cause these dark lines to be produced in the continuous spectrum to form what we call an absorption spectrum. So remember one electron transition here from the lower to the higher energy level will be associated with one dark line on this spectrum. And that means our answer here is E. Electrons move from lower to higher energy levels by absorbing photons. Question 17 says a ray of monochromatic light passes from air into diamond. The frequency of the light in air is 5.09 times 10 to the 14 hertz. The speed of this light in diamond is. Well, because we're using diamond here, we can use the refractive index for diamond from the data sheet, which is 2.42. And we can also use this relationship, n equals v1 over v2, which is the refractive index equals the ratio of the speeds. Where v1, remember, is the speed of light in air, and v2 is the speed of light in the denser medium, in this case, diamond. So substituting in our numbers, we have 2.42 for the refractive index of diamond is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8, which is the speed of light in air from the data sheet, divided by v2. And then to get v2 on its own, we can cross multiply, which is the same as just swapping these two terms round. So we end up with v2 equals 3 times 10 to the 8, divided by 2.42. And if you put that into your calculator, you should get an answer for v2 of 1.24 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Or another way you could do this is to use v equals f lambda to find the wavelength of light in air, and then use n equals lambda 1 over lambda 2 to find the wavelength of light in diamond, which is lambda 2, and then use v equals f lambda again using the frequency value given above, since the frequency of the light stays the same. However, that obviously requires a lot of extra work, whereas this method here is just using the one equation. So that means our answer here is C. Question 18 says a circuit is set up as shown. So we have a 12 volt power supply and then a 60 ohm resistor in series with a parallel combination of a 30 ohm and a 20 ohm resistor. And it says the power supply is a negligible internal resistance. The potential difference across the 60 ohm resistor is. Well, to find the potential difference across the 60 ohm resistor, we can use potential divider equations. But what I want to do first is simplify this combination of two resistors into just one equivalent resistance. So what I'm going to do is label this combination number one, and I'll label this second resistor number two. And so for this combination, let's find the total resistance of that. First of all, using one over RT equals one over R1 plus one over R2. And then substituting in the numbers gives one over 30 plus one over 20. And then using the lowest common denominator method, we could see what the lowest number is that 20 and 30 both go into, which is going to be 60. Or you can just sub this straight into your calculator and get the answer. But to get both of these into the denominator of 60, I'm going to times the top and bottom here by 2, and the top and bottom here by 3. So we have 2 over 60 plus 3 over 60 simplifies to 5 over 60. But remember that's 1 over RT, and to get RT on its own we need to flip both fractions. So we end up with RT over 1, which is the same as RT, is equal to 60 divided by 5. And doing that in your head or putting it into your calculator should give you an answer of 12 ohms there. So now we have essentially a 12 ohm resistor in series with a 60 ohm resistor. And now I can use my potential divider equation where I know what the supply voltage is, Vs. So because we've labelled this 2, let's try and find V2. So we can use V2 equals R2 over R1 plus R2 times Vs. Substituting in the numbers gives 60 divided by 12 plus 60 times 12 volts for the supply voltage. And putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 10 volts, which is the answer E here. Question 19 says a resistor of resistance 2.2 kilo ohms is rated at 0.25 watts. 
The potential difference across the resistor when operating at its rated power is. Well, notice how we're given a power and a resistance and we're asked for the potential difference or voltage. So we need to use a power equation involving voltage and resistance, which is P equals V squared over R. Substituting in the numbers, we have 0 0.25 equals V squared divided by 2.2 times 10 to the 3, where we're converting 2.2 kilo ohms into ohms. And then we can cross multiply to get V squared on its own. So we get V squared equals 0 0.25 times 2.2 times 10 to the 3, which gives 550. And then to get V on its own, we need to square root both sides. So the square root of 550 in your calculator gives V equals 23 volts, which is the answer B. Question 20 says a circuit is set up as shown. So we've got a battery with an internal resistance and then a voltmeter connecting in parallel. We've then got an ammeter and a variable resistor. It then says the resistance of the variable resistor is changed and the corresponding readings on the ammeter and voltmeter are used to produce the graph shown. So we have voltage and volts on the y-axis against current and amps on the x-axis. And you can see we've got this solid line with some dashed lines as well to help us. It then says a student makes the following statements based on this information. Statement 1 says the EMF of the battery is 12 volts. Statement 2 says the internal resistance of the battery is 10 ohms. And lastly, statement 3, the short circuit current is 1.2 amps. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, starting with the first statement, the EMF of the battery is 12 volts. Now we need to go back to our graph of terminal potential difference against current. And remember the EMF from a graph is given by the y-axis intercept. So if we extend our line here, you'll see if we're going up in twos here, then it's cutting through at about 14 volts. So that means the first statement that the EMF of the battery is 12 volts must be wrong. Statement two, the internal resistance of the battery is 10 ohms. Well, remember to find the internal resistance from a graph of terminal potential difference against current. We can choose two points in the line and then use the fact that minus r is equal to the gradient. So choosing two points in the line here, using the dashed lines to help us, we have 0 0.2 along and 12 up, so that's 0 0.2, 12. And then we have 1.2 along and 2 up, so that's 1.22. So here's our points x1, y1 equals 0 0.212 and x2, y2 equals 1.22. And then to find the internal resistance, we can say that negative r is equal to the gradient m, which is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which equals 2 minus 12 over 1.2 minus 0 0.2, which equals negative 10. And notice how the negative r equals negative 10, so the negatives will cancel out, and we therefore end up with r equals 10 ohms. So that second statement there that the internal resistance of the battery is 10 ohms, that is true. And lastly, the short circuit current is 1.2 amps. Well, remember for a short circuit current, the load resistance r, and therefore terminal potential difference v, effectively becomes zero. So we could say that v equals zero for a short circuit. And therefore, if we look back at our graph for the current at which v equals zero, that is going to be if we extend this line down here. So we can extend that line to cut through the x-axis at about 1.4 amps when v equals zero. So therefore, it's not 1.2 amps like the statement said. So therefore, statement three is wrong, and we therefore have that statement two is the only correct answer. So that gives us the answer b here. Question 21 says a capacitor is initially uncharged. The capacitor is now charged for 20 seconds using a supply that provides a constant current of 0.10 milliamps. The potential difference across the capacitor is now 12 volts. The energy stored in the capacitor is. Well, notice how we've got potential difference, but we don't have a charge, so we can't use the energy equation for charge and potential difference just yet, but we do have a time and a current, so we can use those to find the charge first of all. So we can do Q equals IT, and substituting in the numbers gives 0 0.10 times 10 to the minus 3, where we're converting milliamps into amps, times 20 for the time, and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 2 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. Then we can use our equation for energy in terms of charge and potential difference, which is E equals a half. QV. Substituting in the numbers gives a half times 2 times 10 to the minus 3 times 12, and putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2 joules, which is the same as writing 12.0 times 10 to the minus 3 joules, or 12.0 millijoules, which gives us answer B here. Question 22 says a circuit is set up as shown. So we've got a power supply of 12 volts, we've then got a switch S and an ammeter A in series with a resistor and a capacitor. It says the capacitor is initially uncharged. Switch S is now closed and the capacitor charges. The graph shows how the charging current I in the circuit varies with time T. So we've got current I in milliamps on the y-axis and time T in milliseconds on the x-axis. It then says the capacitor is now replaced with an uncharged capacitor of greater capacitance. The same charging process is repeated with this capacitor. Which graph shows how the current I varies with time T as this capacitor charges? Well, going back to look at the graph, notice how it starts at a maximum current of 30 milliamps and it decreases to 0 milliamps in a time of 50 milliseconds. 
And the only thing that's changing here is that the capacitor is replaced with one of greater capacitance. And we can firstly say that the resistance is unchanged, so the maximum charging current will stay the same. So therefore the current will start at the 30 milliamps, which means our answer can only be C or D. We can rule out A, B and E as our answers. And we could say that a greater capacitance means a greater charging time, so it's going to take longer than the 50 milliseconds to decrease to 0 milliamps. So remember we're just looking at these two graphs and you can see the current decreases to 0 milliamps at 50 milliseconds but that's showing no change to the time of decay whereas this one is what we want, that's showing an increase beyond 50 milliseconds. So that means our answer here is C. Question 23 says solids can be categorised as conductors, insulators or semiconductors. The diagrams show the valence band and conduction bands of three solids X, Y and Z. So we have these energy band diagrams where you've got energy of electrons and the solids X, Y and Z side by side. So for solid X we've got the conduction band and valence band overlapping. For solid Y we've got this small gap between them. And then for solid Z we've got this huge gap between them. It then says which row in the table shows the letters that represent a conductor, an insulator and a semiconductor. Now remember conductors like metals will have overlapping conduction and valence bands, i.e. no band gap. For semiconductors we have a small band gap and for insulators we have a large band gap. So that means we have a conductor, semiconductor and insulator. So for conductor we want X, for insulator we want Z and for semiconductor we want Y. So it's going to be X, Z, Y which is option D here. Question 24 says an increase in the temperature of a semiconductor increases its conductivity by allowing more electrons to reach the conduction band, increases its conductivity by increasing the band gap between the valence band and the conduction band, decreases its conductivity by allowing more electrons to reach the conduction band, decreases its conductivity by allowing fewer electrons to reach the conduction band, or has no effect on its conductivity. Well firstly we need to remember that an increase in the temperature of a semiconductor will increase its conductivity, so it's going to be either A or B here. An increase in the temperature will not increase increase the band cap, it's going to allow more electrons to reach the conduction band instead. So that means our answer here is A. Lastly, question 25 says a student connects four identical red light emitting diodes LEDs to a 2V RMS AC supply as shown. So there's our 2V RMS AC supply. We've then got LEDs P, Q, R and S. And you can see that R and S are in the same branch in this parallel circuit, whereas LEDs P and Q have their own branch. It then says which of the LEDs P, Q, R and S will emit light? Well we can say that since an AC supply is used, current will change direction. And that comes from the definition of alternating current, which is a current that changes direction and instantaneous value with time. So since the current is changing direction here from the supply, that means that LEDs P and Q which are on their own branches will conduct for one half cycle each. That means for half the time the current's going to flow this direction through the straight line part, whereas half the time it's going to flow this direction where it wouldn't work. And the same goes for LED Q, where half the time the current's going to flow down here in the correct direction to make the LED light, but half the time it's going to flow down this direction where it's not going to light. So that means we could say that P will conduct for one half cycle and Q will conduct for the other half cycle. Whereas the bottom branch won't light at all because you've got two LEDs pointing in opposite directions there. So that means that for the half cycle the LED S would conduct for example, then LED R wouldn't conduct, so therefore the current wouldn't be able to flow along that branch. And same goes for the half cycle where LED R conducts, then for that half cycle S will not conduct, so again the current wouldn't be able to flow there. So we could say that R and S are facing opposite directions, so no conduction is possible. So therefore we have that P and Q can conduct for a half cycle each, so therefore our answer is C. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Whoa.